We are in session two of the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll be undertaking a chapter, chapter two, and uh, I'd like to sort of review where we are. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, we have four Gospels presenting Jesus Christ from four different points of view. And it's interesting to, number one, understand that, to understand each gospel, but it's also provocative in a number of ways. Matthew is Jewish. He's a Levi. He presents Jesus Christ as the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the King. Mark, who's really the uh, secretary for Peter, we believe, um, is re focuses on Jesus Christ as the suffering servant. Many of the Jews felt there were two Messiahs in the Old Testament, the suffering servant and the reigning king. And that's really what Matthew talks about the reigning king very clearly. Mark really focuses on the suffering servant. And it, it, many rabbis have finally realized that their perception of two messiahs really is two comings of the same messiah. But in any case, uh, Luke is a Gentile doctor. He's not interested particularly in the Jewish roots. He's interested in his humanity. And uh, John, of course, is the mystic. He presents him as the son of God. Now, because of that focus, there are three of the four Gospels have genealogies uh, that are different, incidentally. Matthew presents his genealogy starting with the first Jew, Abraham, takes it down to, through David, down to Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ. Mark is not interested in pedigree for his purposes, so he doesn't have a genealogy. Luke, being a doctor, starts from Adam, the first man and carries it all the way through, through Mary, uh, the mother of Christ. And uh, John has a genealogy most people don't recognize. The first three verses are the genealogy of the pre-existent one. And uh, in any case, Matthew emphasized what Jesus said, proving that he was a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Mark what Jesus did. The Gospel of Mark is like a shooting script. He doesn't speak of grass, it's green grass, and so forth, if you notice that. It's always action and so forth. And you can hear Peter all through it. Luke was interested in his humanity. He emphasized what Jesus felt, his compassion, and so forth. And John focuses unquestionably on who Jesus was, or we should say is. Mel Gibson did a remarkable job with his movie The Passion. But one of the things it can't get across... I don't know how you would really, is, not, is that the crucifixion was not a tragedy, it was a, an achievement. And the whole issue is who he was, and he, of course, the Son of God. Uh, continuing this, the Matthew thus is speaking to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek, and John to the church. In that spirit, then, the first miracle in Matthew is a very Jewish thing, the, the, the cleansing of a leper, a leper, a leper being symbolic, of course, of sin, among other things. Both Mark and Luke being Gentile in their focus is a demons expelled and each of them is the first miracle. John's first miracle is a strange one to be a first miracle, the water and the wine. But it's a very mystical thing demonstrating that Jesus was the Lord of the Torah among other things. Again, Matthew ends with a very Jewish thing, the resurrection. Mark, the ascension. Luke, the promise of the Spirit setting up, of course, his sequel, which is Luke volume 2 called the book of Acts. And John ends his uh, gospel with a promise of a return, which sets up his sequel, which, of course, is the book of Revelation. So we see structure there. We see the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over these things. When we study the camp of Israel, when we're going through the Torah, we notice that the, four, the 12 tribes were camped in four camps on the east, west, south, and north. And uh, the ensign of those four camps, uh, the lead tribe in the... Uh, uh, east side was, of course, Judah, the, the, which had as ensign as the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. On the west was Ephraim, which had the, as his ensign the ox. On the south, Reuben, that man. And on the north, we had Dan, which was originally a serpent, but then a serpent with an eagle in its mouth, and ultimately the eagle. And so we have those four faces, which, of course, we recognize as the four faces of the cherubim. Every time we see the throne of God, we see these cherubim with the four faces, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And, of course, uh, so... One of the things that we, of course, we're not going to go through all of these, but just to give you a quick focus, you'll see how Matthew singles out presenting Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. And, uh, okay, the th one of the basic things in our whole 
approach to the Bible in general and the gospel in particular is we're dealing with 66 separate books penned by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other over several thousand years, and yet we understand it's an, it, we discover it's an integrated message. And that integrated design anticipates in detail events before they happen, which proves, in fact, you can demonstrate that the origin of this message system is from outside the dimensionality of time. You can prove it. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can, if you do your homework. Demonstrates integrity, even though it's 66 books by 40 guys, and discover that it is organized in incredible detail and incredible precision. Our whole epistemological approach is to first to establish the integrity of that design, and we'll do that probably on every page as we go through it. And from that design, then, it presents the reality of Jesus Christ. And once you establish his deity and his identity, he, of course, authenticates the package. And uh, so that's our approach. We went through the genealogies in chapter 1. May, remember, those of you who have been with us in Genesis, remember that the first ten names spell out a message. That man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, whose death? God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort. And so this is a, this is, you'll never convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah. Never, never. In any case, uh, and of course, Noah being comfort or rest. Okay. Um, Matthew, being Jewish, he starts, he goes from Abraham to David, and Luke, of course, in his genealogy, it goes, it's in Luke 3, by the way, I forgot to mention that last time, so like, where is it, it's not in Luke, I don't see any genealogy in Luke 1, no, Matthew 1, Luke has his geneal genealogy in 3, and he goes backwards, he takes back to uh, 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 Adam as the son of God, but uh, so they're, they're identical up to David, but then some strange things occur. Uh, we also talk about Boaz, Obed, and Jesse, and David, which are predicted in the book of Judges, in the time of the Judges, in the book of Ruth, and are also encrypted behind the text in Genesis 38. We took that last time. But uh, in, Lu in Ruth, we have this strange prediction, which depends on the fact that a bastard cannot inherit for ten generations. And we go through Perez which is detailed there in the prophecy, the 10th generation is none other than David. So here we have a prediction in effect of David long before Samuel in the time of the judges. And again, those four are encrypted in, in, uh, genealogy, in uh, Genesis 38. A key pivotal verse what we touched last time was Jeremiah 22, 30, where God pronounces a blood curse on the royal line after, from following Jeconiah which is a very provocative verse to confront a rabbi with because according to that blood curse, none, of, uh, none following um, Jeconiah in the throne, uh, will accede to the throne of David. Well, the, the Messiah has to be an exception somehow, and he is. The only way you can have an exception is to have a virgin birth. If you examine this, there's no other conclusion you can come to that this is a, another one of those prophecies that point to a virgin birth. And uh, Jeconiah, also called Coniah and sometimes called Jehoiakim. But the house of David, when both Luke and Matthew get to the house of David, they take different turns. Matthew goes through the first surviving son of Bathsheba through Solomon, and he takes his right on through to the legal uh, uh, father of Joseph, the legal father of uh, Jesus Christ. Luke does a strange thing. When he gets to David, he takes a left turn, so to speak. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, down through the genealogy that ends up with Heli, the father of Mary. So Matthew has the, the, the male line, and Luke has the bloodline. And uh, the daughter Zelophad, very important exception in the Torah to understand, that the daughters can inherit if there's no sons to a father, the only daughters, if the daughter marries in the tribe, the father of the bride could adopt the husband as a son and thus establish inheritance. That was requested of Moses in Numbers 27, granted by Joshua in Joshua 17. And most commentators don't catch the fact that the claims of Christ hang on that exception. Because the husband's adopted by the father of bride, and that's exactly how um, Joseph becomes the son of Heli. He's the son-in-law of Heli. And so it's uh, in, in uh, Luke 3.23, it says nomitso in the Greek in the text, which means reckoned as by law. We call it a son-in-law. Anyway, the virgin birth. Hinnadat in the Garden of Eden. 
prophesied by Isaiah, of course, 714, and required, if in effect, by the blood curse in the royal line in Jeremiah 22.30. So, now, Matthew points out there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, and then there's 14 generations from uh, Solomon to the Babylonian captivity, and uh, 14 from the Babylonian captivity to Joseph. The, but if you count them, you'll discover there's 17, not 14 in that line, because three of them are blotted out because they were, they died, be, they were killed because of idol worship. And uh, the other two, Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin, were the ones that are under the blood curse, of course. There are two that are in common to both, strangely enough. People get confused by this because Salathiel and Zerubbabel are, appear in both genealogies. Now, it's conceivable that they were two, two of the same name, but more than likely what the situation is, is that since Jehoiachin, or Jehoiak, uh, yeah, Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, uh, has the blood curse, uh, had they re, uh, uh, when they returned from, uh, from Babylon, um, I believe that Salathiel was the adopted uh, son of, uh, of uh, Jehoiachin, not, not the bloodline. And, uh, but the bloodline continues to, down to Mary, because he was the son of Neri, we find out from Luke and so forth. Anyway, those are small points, but let's move on. That's our basic premise, 66 books penned by 40 guys over th several thousand years. Why we accept the Bible? Because, we f the, because of its authentication of Jesus Christ. The Septuagint, the Greek translation, three centuries before Christ was born, details over 300 specifications that his life fulfilled. And the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy alone predicts the exact day he'd present himself as, uh, to Jesus, as, as the, uh, uh, the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the King. Once you realize who he is, the authentication by Christ of the Torah, of Daniel, and in fact the whole Old Testament is, uh, ties it all together. Integrated design, transcending time altogether. Now, there are many specifications that you're aware of, of course. He's born of a virgin, and he was. It said he would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. And he would be taken into Egypt, and he was. He would seal the sick and make, and make uh, people whole. Of course, he did. That he would be crucified. That's predicted in detail in the Old Testament. And, of course, he was. And he would die for our sins, was predicted. And he did. And he'd be, that he would be raised from the dead. And he was. There are over 300 of these. I'll spare you the rest. Let's move on. Chapter 2 is going to deal with the visit of the Magi. What are the Magi? Many people are confused about that. The massacre at Bethlehem, the flight to Egypt, and then the return to Nazareth is going to be our primary themes here in chapter 2. Let's back up a little bit and get a per biblical perspective of the world empires because there's a piece that's missing in most people's background. Obviously, it all starts in Babylon, which eventually becomes the Babylonian Empire in about the 6th century B.C. They get conquered by the Persians. The Persian Empire goes from 539 to about 332, and a young upstart, Alexander the Great, conquers the Persian Empire. Now, in the Persian Empire, they had a, her a hereditary uh, priesthood of the Medes, and they were called the Magi. And it's an ancient, that's a Greek transliteration of the Persian original. Rab Mag is the chief of the, Rab, of the Magi. There were some in Nebuchadnezzar's court serving him. And it was one of the titles that Daniel gets in his uh, writings in Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5. Daniel was appointed as chief of the Magi. Now... That doesn't go over so well with the priests that are, he's in charge of because they're used to a hereditary priesthood. That's what sets up the lion's den situation under, under uh, Darius the Persian. So there's a whole background there. We'll keep moving here. If you, you want to understand these magi, oniromancy was their main skill, not astrology. That's the interpretation of dreams. That, that's what they were into. They knew a lot about astronomy, but uh, they're not, they were not astrologers. Herodotus makes that clear in his writings. They were established in the state religion in Persia by Darius the Great. After some of the Magi were considered to be expert in the interpretation of dreams that had been attached to the Median court. That all could have started with Daniel's skill in Daniel chapter 2. That became the, uh, enhanced the reputation of the Magi. They, are, incidentally, were not followers of Zoroaster. Many of your books say that was the original brief. No, Cyclopedia Britannica and others will point out that came later. 
But the Magian religion versus Judaism, it's interesting that the Magian religion was very close to Judaism in many ways. They're both monotheistic of a beneficent creator, author of all good and so forth. They, they each had a hereditary priesthood. They had the Medes, the Magi. The Jews had their Levites, right? and the blood sacrifice and so forth. Each depended on the wisdom of a priesthood in divination. Each held concepts of clean and unclean forms of life. Each involved a hereditary priesthood and uh, so forth. The Magi were the priestly caste during the Seleucid. That's the empire that is when Alexander, when the Greek Empire breaks up. And then the Parthian and the uh, Sasanian periods. Now, some political background. Since the days of Daniel, it's interesting to understand the fortunes of both Persia and the Jewish nation had been closely intertwined. Many people don't realize this. Both nations had their turn of falling under the Seleucid dominion. Remember, the Alexander the Great died. His four, four of his generals took over the four parts. One of was, was Ptolemy. He took Egypt in the south. The Seleucid Empire took primarily the east. And Ptolemies and the Seleucids fought over Judea because it was a buffer state in those days and, and subsequently. And so, but it's interesting, both had regained their independence by the time you get to the Roman period, to some extent. The Jews were under the Maccabean leadership until Pompey finally conquered Judea. And the Persians had, uh, had a dominating ruling group after the Persian Empire uh, fell apart, uh, the, the Parthian Empire. And uh, we need to understand that. It was at this time that the Magi, in their dual, they had a dual role of being both priests and government administrators. That's where we get the term magistrate. It comes from that same background. And uh, they composed the upper uh, ha uh, council of the Magistanes, whose duties included absolute choice and election of the king of the realm. When the king died, the magistrates picked the next king. The Magis did. Get the picture? There's some background here that's important to understand what's going to happen in chapter 2. It was this dual capacity of priest and counselor that was invested in this religious authority. So the Magi became the supreme priestly caste of the Parthian Empire. In fact, there's a very m famous cliff carving called at Behistun. Darius I, uh, this is 522 to 486 BC, Darius the Great, wrote, had it written in three languages, Elamite, Akkadian, and Old Persian or Aramaic. The same things are written in those three languages. It's like a gigantic Rosetta Stone. Now, Rawlinson is famous for having climbed the cliffs and copied it all and translated it. It, is, it has as, as much impact in the linguistic world as a Rosetta Stone does. It's just another thing like that because you've got the same thing in three languages that gives you a way to translate those, new lang those old languages that are new to you now, see? It's, this happens to speak of the speedy and final triumph of a revolt of the Magi in 522. So the, these magi got out of hand, apparently, and Darius straightened that out. In any case, the Greek Empire um, succeeds the Persian Empire, and uh, it, it, it eventually divides. And when da uh, Alexander the Great dies, Cassandra takes the far west, Lysimachus takes that area that we think of as Turkey, and uh, Seleucus took the east, and Ptolemy took the south. And, uh, uh, Ptolemy, and, uh, and Ptolemy and Seleucus, of course, dis struggle, fight over the over four centuries, uh, fight over this buffer state that we know as Judea. They speak of 400 silent years between the Old and New Testament. That's what you'll find books written about what happened in the so-called silent years. What everybody overlooks is those silent years are in the Bible. They were written in advance. Daniel chapter 5 through 35 is, a, is a, a, such a detailed layout of the struggles between the Ptolemies and the Seleucus that the the critics have said that, has to, that had to be written later. They deny its authenticity. They neglect to notice that Daniel was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born. So we won't go, go down that path here now. Obviously, the Roman Empire succeeds the uh, Greek Empire. We even speak of the Greco-Roman culture and so forth. And the, from the Roman Empire on, most of us are familiar with the history, especially its biblical implications. What most of us are probably not aware of, unless we've done some unusual homework, it, what happened to the Persian Empire? When the Greek Empire starts to fall apart, there is a, a empire that ar arises from about 250 BC to about 224 AD. So there's about four centuries there, um, bracketing the Christian period, of the Parthian Empire. The Parthians are very uh, similar to the Scythians in a sense. 
who developed archery to such a fine uh, skill. The, the uh, Skiths could, uh, were proud of the fact that they could bring down a bird in flight while at a full gallop, even shooting behind them. That was one of the symbols of a Scythian air. The Parthians tried to emulate that. They didn't, they, they didn't quite make it. Uh, there is a thing called the Parthian shot. You've probably heard that term. That comes from the idea in retreat. They were very skillful at developing retreats that would suck their enemy into the retreat and then close just, exa- just the way the Scythians did. Anyway, that's the Parthians. Now, and, and incidentally, there, the area that we're interested in, namely Israel, is again, again finds itself in a buffer zone between two empires. The Romans on the one hand, who ultimately succeed, of course, in that area, and the Parthians, who also have a claim. So, Parthia is an ancient empire that, of what is now Iran and Afghanistan. And they were of Scythian descent. They, they adopted Median dress and Aryan speech because they were really you know, vestiges of the old Persian empire. And... Uh, they were subject to successfully to the Assyrians, the Medes, the Persians, the Macedonians, Alexander the Great, and then the Seleucids, but they broke loose from that. About 250 BC, they succeeded in founding an independent kingdom. And during the first century BC, they grew into an empire extending from the Euphrates River to the Indus River and from the Oxus River to the Indian Ocean. So roughly the spot that I showed you on the map there. That's that, 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 but, you know, we're virtually to India roughly from the Euphrates to India in rough, in rough terms. And so that was a non-trivial <laughs> a piece of history. Judea is a buffer zone. About the middle of the first century, Parthia was a rival of Rome, and several wars occurred between them. Pompey, the first Roman conqueror of Jerusalem in 63 BC, attacked the Armenian outpost of Parthia, made a big mistake. In 55 BC, Crassus led Roman legions in sacking Jerusalem and a subsequent attack on Parthia proper. The Romans were decisively defeated at the Battle of Carrhae with a loss of 30,000 troops, including their commander. This was a disaster for the Romans. The Parthians counterattacked with the token invasion of Armenia, Syria, and Palestine. Nominal Roman rule was reestablished of Antipater, the father of Herod, who in turn retreated before a Parthian invasion in 40 BC. Now, once you get the picture here, the point is there's a struggle going on. Who controls the land? You've got to check the calendar, because sometimes it's Roman, sometimes Parthian. Okay. Mark Anthony reestablished Roman sovereignty in 37 BC, and like Carsus before him, he embarked on a similarly ill-fated Parthian expedition. His disastrous defeat was followed by another wave of invading Parthians, which swept all Roman oppositions completely out of Palestine, including Herod himself, who had to flee to Alexandria and then to Rome. So Herod's in Rome three years. He's king of the Jews, but it's not in Judea, it's in Rome. It's, he is a political appointee. He's not even Jewish, he's an Edomite. So with Parthian collaboration... Jewish sovereignty was restored and Jerusalem was fortified with the Jewish garrison. It's interesting to see a history here or a tradition of comfort between the Jews and the Persians. We, 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 sometimes don't appreciate, if you study Persian history, you'll be astonished how often there are Jewish people that are in key, key jobs uh, and even ruling it from time to time. The history is, is very interesting. It's not as anti-Semitic, if you will, as some of these other uh, cultures were. But let's go, keep moving here. Herod, by this time, secured from Augustus Caesar the title King of the Jews. However, <laughs> it's not for three years, including a five-month siege by Roman troops that the king was able to occupy his own capital city. So you get the picture. It's a very unstable. Herod is on a slippery rock. The reason he's there is because of Roman might. So he gained the throne of a rebellious buffer state situated between two mighty contending empires. That's the picture that I want you to understand as we move in Uh, to chapter 2 of uh, Matthew, which will give you a different perspective that most people have. See, at any time, Herod's own subjects might conspire in bringing the Parthians to their aid. For all the Jews are under his rule, 
But it, you can just imagine the kind of intrigues or rumors. He, that's why he was so paranoid. He built Masada and 12 others like it, not as elaborate as Masada. Now let's take a look at the Roman side. Augustus was also aged. Rome, since the retirement of Tiberius, was without any experienced military commander. So they're weak militarily. Pro, now Armenia, in the meantime, was pro-Parthia. And they were fomenting a revolt against Rome. And two, within two years, they succeeded in th throwing off the Roman yoke. But at the time of the birth of Christ, you know, Herod was pretty close to his final illness because he dies within a, 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 a very short to that. Very, very near, and, very, and there's some debate exactly when, but I won't get into that here. So the time's ripe for another Parthian invasion of the buffer provinces, except for the fact on the Parthian side, they got their problems because their, their, their kings are, they're, they're, uh, uh, the, uh, Phraates IV was unpopular and aging. He'd been once deposed. It was not improbable that the Persian Magi were already involved in the political maneuvering requisite to choosing his successor. So you've got instability going on in both camps. The Romans are not the strongest point, and Parthia is not in the strongest point. At this time, it's this time now that the Magi, and recognize these aren't three guys riding camels, these are the kingmakers of the Persian Empire, and there's no, there's no reason to believe there are only three. We think we've, that's a church tradition I'll come back to. But uh, they're, they're, they're uh, in uh, the... Uh, the uh, the absolute choosers of the next king. So it's a group of Persian Parthian kingmakers who entered Jerusalem in the latter days of the reign of Herod. It's conceivable, you can understand how people might assume, that the Magi might have taken advantage of the king's lack of popularity to further their own interests in the establishment of a new dynasty if they could find a suitable contender. In Herod's mind, he doesn't know that they're not there to foment some kind of Parthian intrigue, especially since there's problems in Parthia and problems in Rome at the time. So that all plays. So there's the Parthian Empire, and suddenly you find this entourage. And by the way, I don't think it's three guys on a camel. I think it's a group of them along with military escorts. They're making a penetration into a hostile empire's domain, a contested domain at best. And uh, so they're there with troops as a diplomatic mission, apparently, obviously, but the, whole, the, the, the clue to all of this is in Matthew, the whole city is troubled by their arrival. Not just Herod and his gang, the whole city. So they're uh, traveling in force, as uh, with, you can imagine all the Persian pomp and ceremony, with adequate uh, cavalry escort to ensure safe penetration of Roman territory. And that has to alarm Herod and the entire city of Jerusalem, as it'll say so in verse 3. And you can understand that Herod was frightened when you understand the rivalry in the background that prevailed during his lifetime, the fact that he's on a slippery rock. So, okay, now we're ready to jump into chapter 2, the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, when the, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. You've all heard this around Christmas time. Great. But what you may not realize is their question of Herod is an intended insult. Herod is appointed by Rome, and they're coming saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? Not you, Turkey. Where's the king that we understand has been born? Now, it's interesting. These are Gentiles, and they know that a king has been born, and they know that because they've seen a star? Are you starting to cross some, connect some dots here? Without getting into even more tedious background, I'll tell you what I believe. I may not be correct. But I believe in the traditions that I uh, understand that Daniel, when he was head of the Magi in the Persian Empire, developed a cabal, a close group of people you could trust, and entrusted to them a prophecy that had to do with the star and what to do when they saw the star. And that prophecy given to them in secret, this cabal, was carried down for five centuries. Four centuries, anyway, yeah. Um, 
And I believe they're, 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 they are aware that they are fulfill, they're, they've seen a fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, the question of this star we'll get into. I do not believe it was conjunction with Jupiter. Kepler and others have written there's a number of papers that have conjectured, looked for astronomical explanations, and they don't fit. And I'll tell you, I, I, I think I've unlocked that. I'll come to that in a minute, at least, in, at least for, from my own perspective. So anyway, we've seen a star in the east. He's, they know he's a king. They know he has a, 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 some kind of supernatural star. And they've come to do what? Worship him. You, that, that, this, is, this is not a political move. These guys are on a different kind of mission here. Now, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. Boy, I can imagine. And paranoid as can be, and with good reason. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. That phrase is the clue. This isn't just a group of guys that happened to show up. These are guys that had access to the king. The whole town is unglued. Now, it's interesting. The first question in the New Testament, where is he that's born king of the Jews? The first quotation of the Old Testament, when God called to Abraham, where art thou? Those are the first questions in both cases, right? It's interesting. The first question in the Old Testament deals with the first Adam. And the first question in the New Testament deals with the last Adam. Isn't that wild? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get goosebumps when I find these little things. Yeah. First Corinthians 15, Paul uses that expression of Jesus Christ, that he's the last Adam. And uh, I think I, the, the reason these things fascinate me, they're, they're subtle confirmations of the design. You begin to sense these things, and when you begin to see them predictably, then you begin to realize there's the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over this stuff. Okay, continue. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Hey, guys, check your prophecies. Tell me where this guy's supposed to be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for, it is, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then he quotes, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. They're quoting from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Let's take a look at Micah 5, 2. See how it records in our translation of the Masoretic. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, because there are two Bethlehems, one up north in Ephraim. If this is the one that's in the south in Judea, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Not a big burg, by the way. Maximum population a few thousand. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Uh, here's the line that you don't want to miss. Whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. He's going to be born in Bethlehem, but he's been around forever. He's supernatural. See? Shall come forth unto me. But he's, he, see, he's, pre, he's the pre-existent one. The Messiah, of course. So then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently, what time the star appeared? He's going to add some margin for error there and kill all the babies that are two years old and younger. Because he's not going to let this... You, 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 that's coming, of course, most of you know. Okay. But that's one of the reasons we... That's not when Christ was born. It's when the star appeared. We don't know... The star appeared, apparently, we're guessing from that remark, probably a year or more before. And, and that's... They took travel time, too. So... Okay. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Yeah. <laughs> there are two kinds of people here, as there are in any room. Those that have hatred and those that are paying homage. You won't be neutral. If you understand who he is, you love him. If you don't love them, you'll hate them. Two kinds of people. Two kinds of people. And it's interesting um, that the ones... We have no record of any of Herod's guys coming to worship anybody. We understand the soldiers came to slaughter all the male children two years and younger later, in, 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 as soon as you could get at it. Anyway, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, notice this is not astronomy. This is not navigation. You can, with very relatively simple tools, find your spot on the planet Earth by doing a celestial fix. 
And those technologies were emergent in the region. But that's not what we're talking about here because they missed the town. They came to Jerusalem and they had to be told from the scripture that it was Bethlehem. Follow me? People missed that. This is not a, a, an astronomy or an astro- astrological kind of thing at all. These guys were not astrologers anyway. They were nyromancers, dream interpreters. Anyway, um, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Boy, I can imagine. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with... Notice where, there's no stable now. They're in a house. The stable thing, that first night with the shepherds, was because it was crowded, there was a registration going on, what have you. We don't know if it was the next day or the next week or a few months or even a year later. We don't know. They were apparently able to find more suitable quarters. They're now in a house. When they were coming into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented them with gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream, see, he took the form of communication that would be comfortable to them. They were known as oniromancers. So he doesn't communicate them with, he communicates to them in, in ways they could relate to. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Can you imagine Herod's reaction when he began to realize that he'd been snubbed? Now these gifts, by the way, by the way, these aren't the only gifts. These are just the three that are mentioned. It's perfectly reasonable that these were three among a number of things. Why are these three mentioned? Because they're prophetic. Gold for his deity. Frankincense is the, the uh, spice and so forth that's used in the, in the priesthood in several ways. It's mixed into the showbread by the priests. The showbread, every Sabbath they make 12 loaves and so forth. Uh, Frankincense is, is a, it has its identity with the priesthood. And myrrh has its pr- a primary role as a burial ointment. You crush it as an ointment for burial, which is important to understand if you're going to understand the letter to the church at Smyrna in the book of Revelation and so forth. A little background. So these three things, why? Because they speak of prophet, priest, and king. These are the three primary offices that are uniquely in one person here. All through the Old Testament, you have priests, you have prophets, and you have kings. You don't mix them, normally. There are prophets that were, there were prophets that were priests, Ezekiel and others, but that's that, but you you don't find kings and priests. Judah, if you're a king, you're from Judah. If you're a priest, you're from Levi. You with me? It was different, unless you were Melchizedek or unless you're Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, the Magi traditions, there, all kinds of church traditions emerged. We celebrate Christmas on December 25th because of the, in 354, that calendar, and it was a, it's an institution of the 4th century. The Eastern tradition, so that's a Roman tradition, Western church. The Eastern church has a 12-day thing. Uh, their Christmas is on January 6th. And I remember I was a, a president, I had a chairman of a public company. We had a very critical project for the Department of Defense uh, we were subject to sabotage, espionage that destroyed it, but our guys, to make a deadline, had to work around the clock to reconstruct software that had been stolen. But I remember proudly reporting to the board of directors that our guys, our whole software team, worked through the Christmas holidays to make the deadline. We did. What I didn't tell the, the, the board is that it happens that the key guys were Eastern Orthodox. Their Christmas was January 6th. But anyway... <laughs> I, I can find it. I made it. Anyway, um, in the third century, the, there were traditions that, uh, uh, that they, these, these were not just wise men, they were kings bearing gifts. So it was three kings. We three kings of Orient are as a church tradition. Um, there are relics that were attributed to them that were discovered in the fourth century that were attributed to them, and they were transferred to Constantinople in the fifth century. And there's a whole uh, traditional background here that doesn't have scriptural support. The Western tradition, tradition of course, is that there are three of these guys. An epiphany, as we call it, is January 6th. In the 6th century chronicle, a very key one, they were even given names. Uh, Bithysera, Melchior, and Gethaspa, and there's vari- variations of that through various culture, culture traditions. And then in the 7th century, they become uh, the sons of Noah, or related to the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
representing Asia and Africa and Europe in the minds of some. You'll find these things. These are just church embellishments and traditions. In the 14th century, they now Balthazar is the king of Arabia, and Melchior is the king of Persia, and Gaspar the king of India, and on it goes. These are all just traditions without biblical support. But what about the Star of Bethlehem? You know, every time you go to a planetarium show or every time there's around Christmas, some of the magazines will try to run some articles that sometimes allude there was a prophecy in, uh, by Balaam about the star in Jacob. It's interesting that Numbers 24 is not quoted by Matthew. Matthew never misses a chance to actually put in a quote where it's relevant. I think it's significant that he doesn't link the Star of uh, Bethlehem to the star comment made by Balaam. Some people spring from Isaiah and talk that a conjunction between the planets and Kepler and others have there. You'll find articles along that line that are easily shredded, by the way, but that's neither here. Kepler suggests the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces in 7 BC. It turns out he did it from an erroneous reference in Josephus. There's a wrong date. It's still several years off, but even so, it doesn't fit. I don't believe that the star was a natural phenomenon because if it was a natural phenomenon, it would not have alarmed any competent astronomer, because they, they spend a lot of time studying these things, and uh, this one caused a real stir. No, I think it's something else. We talk about, in the scripture, a thing that called the Shekinah, the glory of God. It accounts for the creation in Genesis 1, that there was dark, you know, darkness on the face of the deep and so forth, but the Spirit of God brooded or fluttered over the waters. First mention of the Holy Spirit. When we get to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, God himself seals a covenant with Abraham by, be, by having Abraham set up the, two, the, the uh, splitting up, um, an offering, as they did in those days, in which the two participants to a sacred co commitment to themselves would re go in a figure eight between them, repeat, repeating the terms of it. He has, God has Abram set that all up, and then puts Abram in deep sleep, and God himself goes in the, uh, through the procedure to make the point that his covenant is um, non-conditional. It's a one-way deal. And uh, he does it in the appearance of a flame there in, in, in Genesis 15. In Exodus 3, the burning bush. All these things are usually typed by... Um, expositors as the uh, uh, evidence is the visible manifestation of the glory of God in the form of fire or flame. And when they go in the wilderness wandering in Exodus 13 and following, we have the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. What is it again? They typically call it the Shekinah, the visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, in the flames of, uh, at the flames that uh, a fire in, in Pentecost. Why not here? Why, it, why is it not reasonable to presume that the star of Bethlehem, as we call it, is a visible um, illumination or, or signpost, if you will, by the Holy Spirit himself, leading these um, magi to the birthplace? And uh, this makes more sense, and it also, the very fact that it moved and showed them where to go tells me it's not some star in the heavens, okay? All right. Anyway, moving on. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, again a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So Joseph packs up his bags, and they split. And I suspect they, they did before morning, and they were on their way. And he arose and took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. This is one of the, another one of these little interesting things. If you, if you track that down, he apparently is quoting from Hosea chapter 11, first verse, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. Big deal. No, this is a very key hermeneutical lesson here. One of the things that you'll hear many uh, preach on is context, context, context. And that's very good advice for many, many things. But there's no way 
that you can go back to Hosea and argue that that passage is messianic. Because clearly the context of the passage has to do with the nation Israel. Okay? It's speaking of Israel as a child, but it's still speaking of the nation Israel. Yet Matthew is applying this verse to that event. You follow what I'm saying? There's some very, very provocative lessons here. How can Matthew, who's a competent Levi, take a phrase that's there in the Old Testament referring to the nation and say that Jesus was a fulfillment of that by being called out of Egypt? We need to understand that. You and I tend to think of prophecy as prediction and fulfillment. A prediction and its fulfillment. And indeed, we can make lists of those and track them. And there is. That, though, is the Greek model. That is the Gentile mind at work. That's not the Hebrew mind at work alone. They also believe that pattern is prophetic. We see that in what we call types and that sort of thing. But we want to be sensitive. In Exodus 4.22, Israel is spoken of as God's firstborn. So here we have the Israel treated as an individual. All through Isaiah, the thought shifts between the nation and the Messiah. Isaiah 41.8, Abraham is a friend of God, and Israel is spoken of as if the nation was an individual. It speaks of Israel, my servant. It speaks of it as if the nation was a person. Isaiah 42, first four verses, the Spirit was upon him. The subjects changed, no longer referring to the nation, but now the Messiah. And the place this really climaxes in Isaiah 52, the end of 52, and the chapter we know is Isaiah 53. The Jews insist upon viewing that strictly as the nation. But there it's very, very clear with the personal pronouns is talking about none other than Jesus Christ. But the, I want you to get used to the idea that there is a pattern that's prophetic. Jesus will reenact Israel's history. They were in the they had wand, wilderness wanderings for 40 years. He goes and fasts for 40 days and so forth. You're going to see all kinds of patterning there. And Matthew will highlight those for us. Let's move on. When Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, it was exceeding wroth. It's easy to be exceeding wroth when your enemies are at a good distance. They're out of town. They can be all angry as well. And he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Again, Matthew very characteristically, he will do this 60 times in his gospel. Not always quite this explicitly, but Matthew says, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken of Jeremiah the prophet, saying, in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. He, of, he, is, he of course, is quoting from Jeremiah. It happens from 31.15, where it reads, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel, we, uh, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. This has relevance in its context, but here Matthew is using it as a forecast, of, you could say taking some poetic license here, saying that uh, Rachel, by the way, is buried near Bethlehem, and she's very endeared to the Jews. So um, uh, he's building a linkage, if you will, between Rachel, Rachel's tomb, if you will, and the children being killed. It's interesting that uh, in Genesis 35:18. When uh, Rachel dies in child labor, uh, she, she's giving birth, and she calls the, uh, the, the child that is born to her the son of my sorrow, or travail, son of my birth pains. And uh, Jacob renames him son of my right hand, Benjamin. It's interesting that Isaiah 53 presents that the Messiah is the man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Psalm 2 speaks of the son as the son of my right hand. So both labels, although they came from Rachel and Jacob's work mouth, they also have come from God's own lips in Psalm 2 because it's the Trinity talking to each other. Anyway, Matthew uh, verse 19. 
And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he rose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he'd heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of the Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, there's a word play on this, okay? And uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, you've all seen Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. A child is born, and a son is given. Those are not the same thing. A child is born, that's the human side. The Son of God is given. You have tucked away in the grammar here the, uh, the dual nature, if you will, of Jesus Christ. All man, all God, both true, thoroughly. Now the increase of his government and peace shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, oh boy, there's a key word upon the throne of David, upon, the, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice for, from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Some people try to allegorize the throne of David as, some, you know, as a poetic term. I personally take the view that's very specific. The throne of David is, is uh, he's not sitting on his throne right now. He's sitting on his father's throne. And he is destined to take the throne of David. He couldn't take it during his ministry because it didn't exist then. Rome, Rome was in, in charge. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. This is Luke chapter 1. Uh, conceive in thy womb. Obviously, the Gabriel talking to Mary. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. There it is again. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his, of his kingdom there shall be no end. A Nazarene. He's going to be a Nazarene. The word Nazarene in the vernacular of the day implied an ignorant man that was a put-down, uh, partly due to being a Gentile area, if it was a figure of speech, and it implied contempt. The word is netzer or branch, a sprout, a shoot, a sprout that grows out from a stump, and that's the way the prophets deal with it in Isaiah 11, verse 2. There, is an, there are intended puns on the word netzer as a Nazarene and as a branch. They, they, the word is essentially the same for both. Okay, so he's going to be a Nazarene. He will be a sprout from the root of David. It's one of his titles. One of the titles that's used in the book of Revelation, the root of David. And uh, now, the branch of the Lord is what Isaiah calls it. He's a royal king from the line. The word, uh, and the word tzemek is also a term in Hebrew for the word branch. Um, in Isaiah 4.2, the tzemek is used. The royal king from the line of David in Jeremiah 23 and also in Je Jeremiah 33 uses the same phrase. Uh, the, the tzemek is the servant of Jehovah in uh, Zechariah. Uh, he'll build the temple in Zechariah 6. There are 20 words that can be translated branch, but only one of them, tzemek, is used exclusively of the Messiah. In Jeremiah 33, 15, In those days at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up into David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. There it is, the, 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 the Tzemek again. And Zechariah 6, And speak unto thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be with them both. And again, his name is the branch. Well, having said this, I want to depart a little bit. This is fringe night. We'll, we'll crawl out into a controversial area called the signs in the heavens, or in the, the, what we call the zodiac. The Hebrews call the Matzeroth. And uh, you need to understand that there is an apparent path of the sun through the sky called the ecliptic. Twelve degrees on either side is a band. There are 12 groups of stars in that band that have the same name in all cultures for thousands of years. They have a deep root. 
Most people have no concept of where that root originally started. We know that all the stars have a name. Psalm 147, verse 4, and Isaiah 40, verse 26. God calls them all by name. Can you imagine? You and I can't imagine how many stars there are. They all have a name. The zodiac, as we call it, comes from Sodi, which means the way. It's the way, okay? The Temple of Dendera, 2000 B.C., is where we get some insights how ancient these, these ideas are. And the Temple of Dendera, and, 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 uh, and we, uh, they have a, a, what we would call a, 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 you know, a, a, a zodiac there of these symbols with these fanciful drawings and so forth. Let's go to the Bible and notice Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And boy, they do in many different ways, but maybe in ways that we never even dreamed. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Wow, that's pretty, pretty impressive. Their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and a circuit into the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. A lot of people quibble with this, say, well, the sun doesn't rise and set. This is pretty out of date. No, they don't understand. I'm not talking about that. Our solar system itself is spiraling to the other end of the galaxies. And so uh, it is literally from one end of heaven to the other, and a circuit unto the ends of it. And nothing hid from the heat thereof. That's the law of thermodynamics. We go into all that. All energy, all life, owes its energy from the sun you know, on the earth. Everything. That light creates photosynthesis, which gives us oxygen to breathe, and it gives us the sugar that do, from which all our other foodstuffs arrive. All, all energy on the planet earth comes from the sun. It's a shocking thing to realize. There are 12 signs from Virgo to Leo to the, in terms of classical terms, from the virgin birth to, lion of the, to the lion of the tribe of Judah. And one of the most fascinating things is to discover these things. A um, couple of back pieces of background I better mention. Everyone's seen these planetarium shows, whatever, where they say that these pictures were the way the stars used to be a long time ago. That's nonsense. They haven't changed that much. There's no way you can create the pictures from the stars. You have a bent W called Cassiopeia, and there's no way that looks like a woman chained to a chair. <laughs> uh, people have forgotten. They, they don't understand what it was really all about. In each of these groups of stars, the stars have names. And if you know the names of the stars in the order of brightness, brightest first, it spells a story. The picture is to remind you of the story. It's got nothing to do with the placement of the stars. Follow me? The trick now is to try to find out the names of the stars, the ancient names, not the current ones, okay? And we're not going to go through all of them. We have a study that goes through most of them, if you're interested in that, called the signs of the heavens. We're just going to pick one. And we're not going to go into the three decans that are associated with each constellation. There's that too, but let's we'll let that go. We're going to talk about the first of the series called Virgo in the popular terms, which means the virgin. Imagine that, Okay? Its primary star is uh, the Alpha, the brightest one, is called Spica. In the Hebrew, it's also called Semek, which is the, always used of a branch, but always of the Messiah. In Arabic, it's called al Simach, and in Egypt, it's called Aspolia, the seed, the seed. And uh, the seed of the woman, Gen Genesis 3.15. She is pictured always through the ancient times with a branch in her right hand and ears of corn in her left. The branch we understand, that's the semic. What's this ear of corn? When Jesus says, a corn has to die before it can give life. How interesting. And there's more to the story than that. But uh, the Zerah, the seed, uh, 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 is uh, Genesis 3.15. And by the way, the seed is singular, not plural. And Paul makes a big discussion of that in Galatians 3.16. The New King James messed that up because it has a plural. And then you get to Galatians, and Paul makes a big case that it's singular, not plural. So I think they may have fixed it by now. But anyway, the Semic means the branch. It's interesting, all through the, the background here, you discover that 
the branch has a dual nature in mythology, in the mythological legends. All these legends got corrupted at Babel. They had roots, I believe, long, many, the Persian traditions are that Adam and Enoch and so forth taught their children the plan of God by the heavens. It is at Babel in Genesis 11 that that all gets corrupted. We know their names and background from pagan traditions that have been overlaid on all this. You with me? So we have to cut through that. But Semek has a dual nature. It's, it's God, and yet he's despised. Well, from Isaiah 13, we can understand that. And uh, this inside of double nature is hinted at the mythology surrounding this constellation. The double nature is embedded in the idea of a sin offering of the despised one at the same time being a king. So the idea, the idea that he's a king, the, the, the virgin birth is of a king that is also made an offering for sin. It's all, believe it, in the background. But here's the interesting thing. In 1893, relatively recent years, we discovered that the star, Semek, is a double star. Not only is it always a dual nature, but even now with modern optics, we've discovered the star itself is a binary. I think that's kind of interesting. Branch of the Lord, royal king, so forth. These are the, all the meanings of the word Semek. Jacob did a final prophecy in the book of Genesis. He said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jacob, in the last chapter, next to the last chapter in Genesis, four, chapter 49, prophesies over each of the twelve tribes. And that's really worth studying. But the most important one is Judah. And about Judah, he, among other things, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah until a lawgiver from, be, or a lawgiver from between, between, uh, between his feet, until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of people be. Well, the word scepter refers to their tribal identity and their right to apply and enforce Mosaic laws and to adjudicate capital offenses, just gladii, capital punishment. And uh, even during their 70-year Babylonian captivity, the tribes retained their identity. They retained their own logistics, their own judges, and so forth. Ezekiel chapter 1 and uh, uh, other commentators make that point. The word Shiloh, or Shiloh, I should say, Shiloh is more proper, <coughs> means he whose it is. And what this really should be translated, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he, who com he comes to whom it belongs. Okay? And this has been recognized as messianic. The term Shiloh is understood by early rabbis and Talmudic authorities as referring to the Messiah in the Targum Ankelos, the Targum Jonathan, the Targum Yerushalami. So the scepter departs. Herod the Great dies... Herod Antipater, his first son, had been murdered. They used to quip that it was safer to be a dog in his house than a member of his family because he killed all his potential rivals, including his first son. So when he dies, his second son, Herod Archelaus, accedes to the throne, and he's appointed ethnarch by Caesar Augustus. But he's broadly rejected by the people. He's finally dethroned and banished in about 6 or 7 A.D. This is all in Josephus' Antiquities, by the way. When he's banished, a guy by the name of Caponius is appointed prosecutor for Rome. And the legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and adjudication of capital cases was lost. This was normal Roman policy. We see that operative, of course, in the crucifixion of Christ. They have to go to Pilate to get permission to kill him. Okay? When they stoned Stephen, that was illegal. When they killed uh, 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 James, that was illegal. In fact, here's from Joseph Antiquities. It's, let me read this to you. It, this is a quote from Josephus. After the death of the procurator Festus, when Albinus was about to succeed him, the high priest Ananus uh, considered a favorable opportunity to assemble the Sanhedrin. He therefore caused James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and several others, to appear before this hastily assembled council and pronounced upon them the sentence of death by stoning. All the wise men and strict observers of the law were at Jerusalem uh, that were expressed their d disappropriation of this act. Some even went to Albinus himself, who had departed to Alexandria to bring this breach of the law under his observation and to inform him that Aranus had acted illegally in assembling the Sanhedrin without the Roman authority. Now, how accurate is it? He's, he's, a, he's an eyewitness of the time, but it's, it's Josephus for what it's worth. Okay. What's interesting is when Caponius takes away their capital punishment authority, the priests put on sackcloth and march around the city weeping because they believe that the word of God had been broken. The Babylonian Talmud, chapter 4, Foley 37, records this. How, Woe unto us, the scepter has departed from Judah and the Messiah has not come. They've assumed that if they understand that 
to the prophecy right from Jacob that it has been violated. Okay? They believed the word of God had failed. They were unaware <laughs> that at that time there was a young boy growing up in Nazareth. And that boy would present himself as the Messiah, the king, on the very day that was predicted by angel Gabriel 500 years earlier. Hallelujah is right. Yeah, I need a, I need a response. Good old southern response here, right? Hallelujah, yeah. I thought it'd be interesting to share with you a, our expedition to Egypt and Ethiopia. And that very briefly, this is Miss Ghana, our guide, Prince of a Guy. Bob Cornuke set this up for us. There's a documented tradition that the tabernacle was set up at Elephantine Island in Egypt in 642 B.C., then it moved to Tanakirkus Island, Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and then finally to Axum, where it's it, with this relic that they've entrusted with, whatever it is they believe is the Ark of the Covenant, is presently at St. Mary of Zion Church in, in Axum. They, it's destined to be presented by, to them, by the, uh, to the Messiah, by them, when he rules on Mount Zion. That's, there's a whole chapter in the Bible, Isaiah 18 on that, Zephaniah 3.10, and a dozen other verses. So we went down the Nile, to, I should say, up the Nile, excuse me, to Elephantine Island, which was the capital. It's a little island fortress. It was the capital of Egypt back in those days where Pharaoh Necho had itself established. We confirmed archaeologically with the German archaeologists that the that tabernacle did reside there uh, at the right time uh, it was it, from about 630 B.C. to about 430 B.C. But um, it was an advanced outpost. It was a, a fortress. It was also the capital, if you will. And uh, it served the Jewish colony there prior to the Persian occupations about five... 500, 400. And this is all in the official guidebook, by the way, of the German Institute of Archaeology. Anyway, moving on from there, we went upriver. I keep thinking down because we think south down. We're actually going upriver as we do all this, up to Lake Tana. You go up then far enough, you get to a huge, huge lake, Tana Kirkus, uh, Lake Tana. And on that uh, lake, there are lots of islands, a very large lake, and a lot of islands. But one of these islands is Tana Kirkus Island. You can't get on there unless you have special uh, arrangements with the, the monks that control it. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant apparently uh, has remained for about 800 years. So we had to go visit that. We went on these reed boats that are the same, just like they're described in Isaiah 18, by the way. And uh, there's Tanakirkus Island. I haven't shown you the hippos you cross as you get there. But anyway, um, this, is, this, is where, this is one of the posts where we believe, we think we saw where the tabernacle was set up back in those days. There's a, they, they, they have a vault of their special treasures that each time we go there, they bring out a few things we haven't seen before. And this is Bob Kernuk inspecting some of the, th the offering stuff that has been left, they claim, from uh, that period. And, uh, and this is uh, the guy that runs the place. And a uh, neat guy. But um, he has a... Um, I was asking you earlier, what is this in my hand? And uh, I have to show you this because this is one of the things that uh, I don't want to... It's about... It's many, many centuries old. So I'm not going to pass it around, gang. Sorry. But it is an Ethiopian Bible. Anybody here read Ethiopian? Okay. Well, the good news is I've got a key page I want to show you that... Uh, this is not this Bible. It's one like it, but it's a, what you see there. You see where he's pointing the finger? That's a picture of um, Joseph and Mary in a bulrush canoe type thing that they use there. That they, in their Bible, claims he visited Tanakirkus Island when Joseph and Mary were in Egypt back. Um, so I think that's kind of fun. Um, thought you'd be interested in that. Anyway, for what it's worth, it's, it's uh, something that I don't think is in your Bible. So I've got something in my Bible you don't have in yours. That's okay. All right. And then uh, it remained there for eight centuries and then went off to Axum, where uh, it is uh, pr still being guarded to this day. And they believe it's their destiny to present that to the Messiah when he rules in Zion. And of course, that we, we think Acts 8, with Philip's encountering the Ro Ethiopian treasure. He had gone there to check it out. Is it time to send it? And he comes back confused because he heard the Messiah come and he's dead. Philip explains that he's going to come back. Baptizes him and uh, he returns to Queen Candace and 
my, 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 my version of the story is that he, when he, tells the king, he tells the queen, not yet. He went there to check it out to see if it was time to deliver it. Anyway, so much for that. What are the major lessons from the session? The messianic line. You really want to understand how God has superintended that line from Adam all the way down to Christ. And the truth is, in the Bible, one of the lessons of that as you get into that isn't just the messianic line. It's the truth is always in the details. As you get into any of these details, you'll discover they'll always emerge with an insight, and that insight will always end up being Christ-centered. It'll always end up pointing to Jesus Christ. The other thing we learned over the last couple of sessions is the precision of the God-breathed text. The more, the more I've studied the Bible over 50 years, each time I've had to revise my views, it's always been in the direction of taking it more literally than before. I think the, the, it's the, the precision and the, the truth is in details. And the other lesson I think that you were beginning to get a glimmer of, and that's this idea that pattern is prophecy. It's a very Jewish idea, but we're dealing with a very Jewish book given to us by a, Jew, a Jewish king. So next session, I want you to read Matthew 3 and 4. We'll take two chapters next time. And while you're at it, since that'll put you in a reading mood, I also want you to read John chapter 1, because he says so much about the same thing. We're going to overlay all of that in our next session.